Hi everyone, hope you're well and welcome to this episode of the Sports Stories podcast, which is episode number 38. Uh, we're coming towards the end of series four uh, and I hope you've really enjoyed the series so far. Um, if you're interested in getting any of the backlog of conversations I've had with my special guests, then please go to uh, our website, which is www.sportsstories247.com. Now, let's jump straight in. This week has been a really special week in some ways, given that I was approached by one of my previous guests, Mr. Ian Braid, and asked if there was any key themes that were coming through from uh, some of the podcasts that I've had so far. And I shared with him these four themes that are coming through for me. I'd be really interested to hear what your thoughts were. The themes so far for me have been something around vulnerability and the strength of that in leadership positions, overcoming adversity and how that has helped and also how adversity sometimes can hinder, a third one would be the power of culture in developing high-performing environments. And, and lastly, the idea of taking and or making opportunities for yourself in your career or the position that you are in your life. So those are the four areas so far, but I'm sure there are many others which, as I say, would be great to hear what yours are. In terms of last week, our special guest was Lucy Moore, um, and we've had some fantastic feedback and comments in terms of uh, the, the gems and the gifts that Lucy has shared with you. So please do listen in. Um, for me, some of the things that she really epitomised, again, was the vulnerability, talking about some of the, the challenges that she's had, but also her ability to really try and be present, learn from her past, but really influence and take control of her future in driving the work that she does and the passion that she has for it. So as I say, please have a, a listen back. Um, now, over to today's show. Um, as I would always say, you know, get yourself in a great position where you can get out of this as much as you possibly can. I'm really keen for this to be entertaining but also to be inspiring and also educational. So don't just listen in, take some of the actions from the gems that drop out of the conversation. Now, to today's special guest I'm really excited for. Um, today I've got with me uh, Kevin Nicholson, who's the head of coaching at Exeter City. This is the second individual I've had from, from the club. Uh, in one of our earlier episodes, we had Aaron Pugh with us, which was really great. So we're getting a bit of a flavor from a couple of guys that are doing some great work down at Exeter. But for me, what's really um, exciting about talking to, to Kevin or Nico, as he's always known, is that he's had so many different roles. He's played. A, he's been a player for many years, uh, a coach, a coach developer. He's been a manager at a club as well, and also he's a parent and children that are involved in sports. So he'll be coming at this from so many different perspectives. So as I say, listening, get what you can from the show. Please let us know afterwards, but please also stay around till after. Uh, the conversation because I will be posing some of my reflections and also posing a couple of questions to help you move on with your learning and your development journey. So it just leaves me to say a very warm welcome to my special guest today, Head of Coaching at Exeter City, Kevin Nicholson, otherwise known as Nico. Nico, thanks for joining me on the Sports Stories podcast. It's uh, brilliant to have you here on a, on a Monday morning. I, I know you've probably had quite a, a busy weekend, uh, but it's just great to get stuck in. First of all, you know, thanks for joining me. Can you tell our guest a little bit about, you know, how did you get into to football? And, you know, we'll come all the way through to your playing days and into your current role as the head of coaching. But start day dot, you know, how did you first get into sport and football? Good. Well, morning, Dave. And yeah, thanks very much for having me. I'm, I'm really looking forward <laughs> to this. So, um, but yeah, um, I think probably like a lot of kids, um, it was my dad was into football. My, you know, my dad played um, when he was young. He was a goalkeeper, played at a, a reasonable <laughs> local level, um, you know, better than most. He, 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 I think he's, his kind of claim to fame was played a youth team game for Notts Forest um, when he was a bit younger and a, a little bit of time in and around Lincoln's youth team as well. Um, and then, yeah, it, it was time spent kicking a ball about the living room as soon as I could kind of walk. It was time spent down the local park, playing with him and my uh, my younger brother. And then, I mean, the, the first time I really kind of, I would say, got into football and became part of a team was Mickleover All-Stars, uh, <laughs> which is a, a little village just outside of Derby, which is where I was born and, and grew up. Um, and it was one of my dad's old teammates um, who was the manager. And the first year was just training. So we used to go down the local kind of um, what was, I think, like a youth club. And there was a pitch outside of it. And we'd just go down there and train for the best part of the season. And then we signed up to a league. Right. Um, so I would have been, <laughs> it seems early to me, but I would have been nine, eight, yeah. nine years old. Whereas, to be honest, you can get on like soccer tops things now where you're playing when you're four years old. So <laughs> in, in, in current standard, it was probably a late start. 
for me, it was about right because I spent time swimming and karate and all the other bits that you you, you can do. Um, you know, my, my mom and dad like a lot, um, spent a lot of time and energy carting myself and my brother around doing these things for for our good and and you know we'd probably throw a bit of that back in the face now and then like uh, like kids do I don't want to do karate tonight I want to go and play football etc and 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 about nine ten years old was when I I finally got the better of that and so my my karate journey came to an end and and swimming went on the back burner and football really took over and and became the driving force behind you know it was what I wanted I think at that point I'd already decided I was going to be a footballer oh Um, wow uh, you know I that was by the time I got to 10 and 11, started to show some promise, became one of the better players in the team. Um, I, I believe they still do it now, but district football. So Derby boys was, was all the best players in the local schools. Yeah. Uh, didn't, didn't get selected for the first, um, the first trial, didn't get in, which I was fuming with. Remember it now, like mm. really, like really gutted that I didn't get in. Um Interesting because I, I watched one of your podcasts with uh, Kev, yeah. um, and you know he talked about <laughs> that, that with his, and it, and it resonated with me. Um, yeah. uh, and I wanted to go back. The, the first trial was at the Derby Boys used to go to a place called Osnabrück in Germany. This is yeah. this the fact that I can remember the place in Germany tells you how. <laughs> Uh, it is on your memory still, eh? <laughs> yeah, and I and I didn't get in, and um, and so I went back the next year and made sure that I did. Um, and then became part of that that group, and they play every Saturday against all the other district teams. So up near us, it was like Sheffield boys, Nottingham boys, Bradford boys, all those guys. Um, and that was around that time was when scouts started coming knocking. You know, with you know, it, it was easier back then for scouts. You know, in the role I'm in now, and having actually, I spent a year scouting myself. Yeah. And um, uh, nowadays, you have to introduce yourself when you get to the the academy. You have to, you know, have your little badge on saying who you are. You get stuck in a corner as yeah. far away from everybody else as possible. You're not allowed to talk to anybody. You're yeah. certainly not allowed to talk to any of the parents. Well, we'll come to the scouting bit, but Nico, what about, you know, when you were sort of eight, nine, ten around that, what kind of a young player were you? You know, you talked about you really got fed up when you didn't get scouted or whatever or chosen. What, how would have you described yourself back then? Um, I was the classic, what we now know as a quarter one, so an October right. early birthday. Okay. I was the classic uh, early developer. So um, I was generally the best player at school because I was biggest, strongest, quickest. Um, yeah. And that, that kind of followed through. So I think it was a really quick development from starting to play to becoming good yeah. because of my physical attributes allowing me to become first pick, captain, always involved. Everybody wanted you on their side, all that kind of stuff. Coaches, I mean, again, you think about the difference now where development football really is development football. Yeah. Not about the results, all that kind of stuff. Back then, you wanted to win the league, whether it was in the district or in your Sunday league team or your school or whatever else. Yeah. It was about. It was a lot more about winning. Everything was set up for for people to want to go out there and need to go out there to win. Right. Um, and so you got picked first. You know, we weren't looking at, at the younger, technically gifted players who couldn't compete physically. Right. There was often, you know, most of the best teams, when you looked at them, were probably six inches taller than everybody else on the pitch. Do you think you had those memories back then? Or do you think this is kind of retrospect now that you know what you know? Yeah, no, I, I, back then I knew that I was the best player or right. one of the best players in and right. around uh, that age group. You know, I, I knew that it came easy to me. Yeah. I knew I was probably going to score two or three, four, you know, more than that. You know, there was games where you'd score six, seven, eight goals, isn't there, when you're at that age. And yeah. It was on big pitches. Yeah. So, again, I didn't know that <laughs> then. But yeah. back then, you got to 10 and you went and played on 11 v 11. So, it's crazy when I look at the 10-year-olds at Exeter's Academy now to think that 20 years ago, we would have stuck them out on a full 11 v 11 pitch <laughs> and go, go and play. Um, you know, that's a huge amount of ground for them to cover. They, they, they'll do game formats like you know seven v sevens now on a yeah. on a small pitch and lots more time on the ball and so on. But so because of that, again, obviously I didn't think it at the time, but I was yeah. physically capable more than most of going up around and down the pitch. So centre midfield scored all the goals, took all the free kicks, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, very much um, 
you look back now and realize that was the case back then i just felt invincible i was i was big strong quick and enjoying football yeah and so then where did you go from there so you kind of moved through carried it on into high school did you is, is that where your sport and your football or did it just stay with football what yeah it, it was football 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 at that point right. so there were, there were no other sports there was nothing else in my um it, it was tunnel vision it, yeah. you know i I was going to be a footballer. So we went through, obviously, you know, 10, 11, you're coming to the end of your, your junior school time and you're going into your high school, as you said there. High school had their own team. The district yeah. football was going really well. Scouts were, were having a look and starting to, to, to look. So when, when I got to kind of 12 and 13, I, I got um, headhunted by, um, by Stoke City. Right. Um, and, and I went and signed um, for Stoke. Um, and, and Nick, uh, what, what role did your dad play in all of this? Because you said, you know, he was a, a goalkeeper involved in the sport world. What, what role did he play alongside your development so in those early it, stages? Again, any, any parent watching this will easily be able to, um, uh, to put themselves in his shoes. He was everything from um, taxi driver to coach <laughs> to you know, mentor to, and my mum was the same, you know, it wasn't right. just a, a dad thing. My, my mum, my mum and my dad met because my mum's dad, granddad, yeah. um, he ran the team that my dad played for. Oh, wow. And my, my <laughs> mum, my mum was um, a tomboy by her own. That's her words, not mine, in case she sees this. Um, and she was massive on sport. She yeah. was one of, you know, go, go back, you know, you, you, what you're talking now, 50 years. Obviously, women's football wasn't massive, but she would play with the boys. She would right, be, okay. you know, she, she would be, but you know, telling the story she tells me, I never saw her play, but she tells me she was dominant. Right. Okay. Um, and she, she was particularly sporty, particularly athletic, and right behind making sure that her kids got that same experience. And obviously, again, my granddad was around at that point, so okay. he was big on it. So I, I was never short of a lift to go and play. I was yeah. never short of football influence around me I was never short of advice yeah um, my mum gave me the two biggest pieces of footballing advice that have stuck with me all like the way that. through my career um, she told me don't celebrate goals because the, uh, the game's not over so this was early when, when I was getting into it this was when it was becoming almost choreographed people were scoring you were coming out of that phase where there was a gentleman's handshake after you'd scored yeah. and now you were getting people dancing and, mm. and running to corner flags <laughs> and playing it as a guitar and all that kind of stuff. And she, we were watching a game one day and she said, don't you ever do that because the game's not over. And it stuck with me throughout my entire professional career and even now. And then the one that was mildly scary, but definitely helped me was if you ever go down on a football pitch and you're not really injured, I will come on and kick you and make sure you are. So I never, ever dived. I never feigned an injury. I never went down unless something was bleeding or something was hanging off. And I, even in professional football, I'd go down and if I'd be lay on the floor and realised it didn't hurt as much as I first thought, yeah. I'd jump straight back up because the image of my mum seeing it and, and saying, no, not you, you're not, you're better than that, stuck with me. Um, and so... And Nico, you, you paint a really lovely picture there for me of that kind of influence that our, often our parents have on who we are and our careers. Um, are there any other kind of uh, lasting messages or influences that they had in your sort of early career that stayed with you? I think just the, the ongoing positive message. Okay, yeah. um, you know, like, it's, it's probably changed a little bit now because of... You know, football's always been a dominating sport. It's always been our national sport, as far as I've ever known it. And, yeah. um, but they were right behind everything I did. You know, like, I want to be a footballer. Well, okay, we'll do what we can to help you become a footballer. Um, I know that, you know, I remember, again, quite vividly going into the um, careers advisor at, at high school, and they sit you down, don't they? Right, so let's have a little talk. First time, I must have been... 12 13 so let's have a little talk about you know the future you're going into your options year so you're going to pick what you're going to be doing for your, for your last couple of years at, at high school so where do you see yourself well i'm going to be a footballer no come on where do you really see yourself let's let's get away from that what do you want to be when you you grow up well i'm going to be a footballer and and the careers advisor just would not have that you're, you, you're not 
let's think about academically what you're going to work on where you're going to get how you're going to get there whereas my mum and dad as long as you got your schoolwork done as long as you did your homework properly and, and again it was driven into me that that had to be the case I always say when I talk to my kids now I would have been I would have been one of those kids that the bullies would have gone for if it wasn't for the fact that I was bigger than them shaving by the time I was 12 and the best footballer because I was blue-eyed boy at school never got detention tell a lie I got detention once and my little girl loves to remind I told her that story <laughs> and that stayed with her um, I got detention once for not doing my Spanish homework but never got in trouble everything was in on time I was never late it was just ingrained into me that you need to do things the right way and that has to be from the parents because there were no other you know there's no other I don't remember a specific lesson like I do with what my mum told me about football yeah. But that was how I was brought up, how I felt. And even now, I get cold sweats if I realise I'm going to be five minutes late for something because it's unacceptable. I need to be on time. Okay. Uh, so there's something there about real standards and belief and being, um, you know, re really turning up, being the best version of you back really from an early stage. Definitely. And I think football then ties into that. So it becomes almost the perfect storm because in football, if it's a three o'clock meeting, you better be there at five to three. And if you're there at five to three, you're pushing it a bit. So you probably make sure you're there at 10 to three. So you, you're always early and you'd better be because as you get older, you get fined and it becomes issues and the manager will come down hard on you. So, you know, it, it tied in really well to, to, to how my life was going and within football and so on. And then I, uh, it, for my last two years of high school, I was fortunate enough, my, my football development went really well. And I got into Lillyshaw when it was the national school. So I spent my last two years there. And again, this was almost professional football at 14. So, yeah. that you know, breakfast will be at seven. So you better be there for breakfast because the coach will be leaving for school at eight and we're not going to wait for you. And, you know, you're going to get picked up from school a little bit earlier than everybody else because we used to miss what is the equivalent of day release now. We used to miss the equivalent of about one day a week at, uh, at school to go and train. So we went back to Lillyshaw from school. We, sometimes it was a, mo a morning that we had off and we trained. Sometimes we missed one lesson on a, a, at the end of school to go back and train. And, and other days we did the full day. But it was trainings at this time, be there. And if you weren't, there was, there was issues. So you got used to being early for everything and on time, you know, making sure you're on time. Homework. You know, we, we weren't like, just get your homework done. It was homework is from six till seven after tea. And even if you've not got homework, you'll be in there for that hour to read or do extra or make sure that you are elite. And that was the, the mindset there. Because we were, at that point, we were seen as the best 16 players in the country. Um, and so that Lilith Shawl is the blueprint for what academies are now. And, and that... If, if you think about the background with the parents, the almost inbuilt will to be, for me personally, to be the best, to be do things right, to be on time, to look right, to make sure that, you know, I was always well presented, to, to all of those things came through your, your childhood and, and your upbringing. And then it was just doubled down when you then went to somewhere like Lillyshaw where all that was expected because you were representing your country. And, and you were away from home for longer periods of time then? Is that right, Nico? Yeah, so I lived away. So all of us did. So yeah. when we, when we, when you get into Lillyshaw, it wasn't a boarding school. You didn't do your, your schooling there, but you lived at Lillyshaw. Yeah. And, and anyone of a certain kind of age will um, know that Lillyshaw used to be like what St George's Park is now yeah. to a degree. Yeah. Um, anybody that any sport, professional sports person that had an injury would often go to Lillyshaw for a rehab week or two. Um, the UK British gymnastics, the, the gymnasts would live there and they would, they would train there. Um, you know, you would get a lot of high profile sports people going there. And we used to live there in the main building. So we'd have our bedrooms and dorms above. Um, we would sleep there and, and we would do it as a, um, a school year. So we'd have a, a six week half term where we would be there and you wouldn't go home. You would do your schooling Monday to Friday, along with your training every day. They gave us Saturday off, and Saturday yeah. was um, some kind of normality. So you could, at Lily Shaw, there was like a little pitch and put golfing thing. You'd go and have a game of pitch and put. There was a snooker table. Go and have a game of snooker if you want. 
you could go to the local uh, shopping mall at Telford and you could yeah. go shopping or there was a cinema there and that kind of thing. And But again, it was like a time slot. You'd leave at this time. You better be ready to leave again at this time and you couldn't be late either way. So it's very structured and, and routinized the whole experience it Shire. was yeah. it was and that suited me perfectly and that you know I, I don't know I don't necessarily know how but my daughter's like that now as well so I didn't specifically try and drum into her what I was but she is basically me when I was her age. Um, Nico what was it what was it like being away from home uh, for that length of time at uh, quite an early part of your life? Again this is where when I look back, it was easy for me because of the level of maturity that I, I, I was at. Um, physically, I was mature. Mentally, unfortunately, my mum and dad split when I was about nine. So I had probably three or four years, if not a little bit longer, of being kind of the man of the house. And that, that I grew up really quickly at that point because I was old enough to know what was happening. And I was old enough to understand the, the hurt and the upset that it had caused and that I needed to step up now I, I use those terms now I didn't sit in my bedroom at 10 thinking that yeah. was the case but it was just a, a natural uh, right this is it I've got to just make sure that I'm good I make things easier I was living with my mom I make things as easy as I can on my mom younger brother was a bit younger didn't really get it as much so I just had to be there so when I left to go to Lillyshaw I, I felt you know I literally was shaving you know like there was like, I think there was two of us at Lillyshaw that had to every couple of days go into the the, the bathroom area and shave yeah. before, before school and things like that. Yeah. And um, it was, I was just particularly mature and grown up. So for yeah. me, it was, easy. there were other boys there who were physically and mentally less mature, who it was a massive struggle for. Yeah. They were away from mum and dad, some further away than others. Again, Telford from Derby is an hour, if that. Yeah. So I always knew safety net. If everything Not went far, wrong, yeah. I, I could, you know, dad can be here in 45 minutes. So it's not really that make, that big a deal. Some lads had moved from London or from the Northeast or Liverpool. And it was a, a little bit, for, it was quite central, but it was still harder for some than it was for others. Um, but I look back on it, you know, with great fondness. I loved it. I loved the two years. I loved the, the experience. I loved what it gave me. You know, we, we got to play for, for England. We got to go to, you know, I, I, biggest kind of name drop that I can throw out there at this point is that in our under 16s year we got to go to Brazil and play against Brazil and Ronaldinho was playing for them so it's I got bad. to see <laughs> well you know but it's it's my favorite quiz question if you ever I, I, around with the lads and uh, or the kids and it's like they want to ask you the best player you played against is you can kind of go well I don't like to talk about it but uh, I did play against Ronaldinho in Brazil and, and, <laughs> and that he's still young enough that they remember who he is and how did you get on? <laughs> we got absolutely pumped. He got three and we got beat four two. But that, you know, I leave that bit out. That, they don't need to know that. They, they, that tends to be the next question, unfortunately. So I, I have to be honest. And but I guess there's something there for me about what a great experience, wasn't it, in terms of going to Brazil and playing against some you know, fantastic players. And But, but you know, by the hard work and the energy that you put in and the commitment, you, you reap some rewards quite early on. It's something for me about really beginning to recognise the the sacrifices and the energy that you needed to put into becoming a, a an elite performer at a young age. And I, and I think that was it. I think the, the sum of it's been lost because of the, the change in generation, the change of, you know, the people use the word old school and it's almost a slur, but actually some of old school is worth holding on to, you know, like, so we were having to, it sounds like nothing, obviously, but for a 14 year old, every day we had to clean our boots. So we got in, you had to make sure that your boots were clean. Not just clean, but clean, polished. There was no white boots back then. It was yeah. your, your, your black Umbro Speciales. You better make sure that you clean them, dried them, uh, polished them, shined them. You know, it was, it was in, that, in that sense, there was a discipline. You had to make your bed every morning. You know, like I know you, you can look online and see lots of um, yeah. military types talking about making a, the bed being a real big thing for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was something you had to make sure that you were up, bed was made, you were ready and uh, your boots were clean for every session. So there was a, a discipline and almost a, an earning of your stripes. And, and obviously when you leave Lillyshaw, you went to your club and you became a YTS, what we now know as a scholar. Yeah. And again, back then, you had to clean all the first team's boots. You had to do all the jobs around the place. So you had to hoover, you had to clean, you had to tidy, you had to brush the stands from time to time. 
And Nico, and, what did that bring to 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 you and the people around you back then? Do you think that might be missing now, or, or how is it replicated in this day and age? Would you say it, it isn't as well as it could be? I don't think in some mm. in some ways. And I'm always really wary because, again, in my current role as a head of coaching, it's brilliant because you get to learn about all the up to date modern ways that kids learn, that people learn, that you know the psychology of it, all that kind of stuff, and how best to get through to people. And I was fortunate that. In my career, I probably had three generations. So when I first left Lillishall and went to Sheffield Wednesday, that was the end of the drinking generation. So that was the time where you went away after the season. Everybody came back two stone heavier because they'd gone to the beach and drank beer all, you know, for two months. Yeah. And they came back and they didn't do any exercise. And the first two or three weeks of pre-season were long cross-country runs just to shift Catch some up. weight. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was too heavy. Um, you you then got into this bit where people realised that you couldn't really maximise your potential. Take into account that was a Premier League club at the point at that yeah. time. You then got to the point where people realised that um, you, you go away for your summer holiday and you go away and you stay fit. So you maybe have two or three weeks off, but then you get back in the gym and then you do your running and then you get to make sure you come back to a certain level of conditioning. Um, and, and with that drinking generation, I suppose, was a a way that people spoke to each other yeah. that you look at it now doesn't work. You know, managers ruled through fear. Older pros would, if you looked at it now, it would be, it would be deemed bullying in a lot of ways. You know, like if I say that we had to do the jobs, you know, if I didn't knock on the first team's door to go in and pick their kit up and get their boots, if I just walked in, I would get a boot thrown at my head for not knocking and asking permission to do it. If that happened now, and probably rightly so, the boot getting thrown at the head would be reported and that first team player would be reprimanded for doing so. So, mm. you know, this is the balance between some old school values, working hard, um, doing jobs, doing the ugly jobs that they're perfectly safe to do. They're just not overly fun, yeah. sweeping stands and, and so on and so forth. But yeah. you earned, it felt like you earned your stripes. So when you signed as a pro, You'd done that. You'd been there. You'd been through the, the hard work and the grind. And now you might be able to finish work two or three hours earlier than what you could do when you were quite TS. You, you really make me think, though, about, you know, even those, that earning your stripes kind of concept. And even, you know, the, 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 the great work that the All Blacks sort of promote in terms of the legacy and them sweeping the stands and sweeping the sheds and that kind of stuff. And that, that's not about earning your stripes, is it? That's even about kind of nearly respecting your environment, isn't it? And, you know, yeah. and, and it's, it's just a, a really interesting kind of standard, isn't it? And culture I think that, that creating. That link and the way you've described it, it's better than I described it there. So I think it, it, it for us, it was coming through as a young player and, yeah, yeah, and nice. earning the right to be there. But too often back then, and this is where the All Blacks have absolutely nailed it, is too often it was like, well, thank God, I've not got to do that crap anymore. And then you went away from doing all the stuff that got you to where you were. Now, the All Blacks recognise the value of your environment and how important it is to look after each other, how important it is that regardless of age and stature and all the rest of it, that you are all pulling in the same direction and, and you're all equal in that sense. It, that was, again, probably the, the generation of, well, thank God for that. I've not got to clean these boots anymore. And then I'll become the guy that throws boots at some poor lad's head when he walks in the first team dressing room. Yeah. So it, it was that that cycle started to break because, you know, health and safety and welfare and so on became a lot more. Um, yeah. The generations changed. So, again, on the pitch. Back then, if I was having a bad game, the older pro would turn around to me and in no uncertain terms, and I don't think we can swear on this podcast, but <laughs> would absolutely drill you. Yeah. And you'd maybe turn around if you were brave enough and tell him to back off. Yeah. And then you'd probably finish the game. You'd both be a bit pumped up. You'd finish the game, you'd shake hands and you'd laugh about it. And, and again, as I went through the middle part of my career, there was still an element of that where you'd have a real go at your teammate on the pitch he'd have a real go back at you because generally they didn't go yeah you're right um but after the game you'd shake hands laugh about it and move on to the next one and it was a a, a tool of i suppose mutual understanding that you are fighting the same fight you want your levels to be going up here and you would push each other and it wasn't personal 
How was it playing in that time then, you know, playing in that kind of environment when you were maybe the younger one coming through and having the older, more experienced players talk to you in that kind of way? Because I guess you were also part of the, you, you needed to be part of the change of culture, didn't you? You know, it didn't change around you. You were part of it. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, if you didn't take it, you didn't make it. Right. So if you if you couldn't accept some harsh words and you couldn't accept you know, the hairdryer treatment now and then, you know, I, I vividly remember that my, one of my, my second third team that I went to play for, Notts County, the manager at the time was a guy called Jockey Scott, who was Scottish, believe it or not, with that name. <laughs> with that name. Um, and in one of my first few games, we were playing away at Mansfield and it was um, a local derby in the cup. We were 3-0 up and, and coasting. And just before half time, I went to clear the ball and I kicked the floor first. And the ball dribbled to one of their players who knocked it one way and then they finished and it was 3-1 at half time, and came in and Jockey Scott got there in my face. And it must have been five minutes of absolutely screaming at me. And I was only 20. Wow. And, wow. and I could see just through, just through the gap of his face, I could see the rest of the lad's shoulders starting to go where it was really quite funny how badly I was getting it. Now, if you did that nowadays, there would be uproar. Like there would be fights, there would be uh, PFA involved, there would be all that kind of, because you cannot rule through fear like that was. But then it was acceptable and you had to just deal with it. And so there was an element where not saying it was the right thing to do, but it certainly sieved through those that were mentally capable of taking some real tough times and those that would fade away. Now, again, it was way too far that way. There was an element of bullying within it. How did it go for you, though? How did you find being dealt with and treated in that way? Did it work for you as a player or did it impact on you in a positive or a negative sort of way, would you say? It, 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 I think because, again, it was probably my individual character was such that it worked for me positively. And in fairness to most of those types of guys, and I say most because some were just not great people, but Jockey Scott, the very next day, would call me in the office, shake my hand, tell me that he wants my standards to be a bit better, but well done for taking it, and off you went. And so there was a, again, I understood and respected him as a manager and as a person, and I would therefore accept that every now and then he would get a little bit overly aggressive like that. Um, to some people, it was horrendous. And if you look at things nowadays, it would, it would cause depression, it would cause anxiety, it would cause all the stuff that we're now a lot more versed in and, and aware of. And, and I think that, again, because of the change in generation, you cannot rule that way anymore. You know, my, the best managers when I first came through would tell you what they wanted. So you go and do what they wanted. The really, really best managers might tell you how. So this is what I want and this is how you're going to do it. Almost never would a manager back then tell you why. And you certainly would never ask why. Simon Sinek and all that kind of stuff now, where you start with the why. Nowadays, the, the young players want to be a part of it. So my experience in management is I got my best results and my best team spirit and my best buy-in when the plan was made by all of us. I might have guided it here and there as to how I wanted it doing and how I thought would best suit the, the guys that we had in the dressing room. But people want their say now. People want to know why. Well, why am I going to do that? Why should I do that? And Nick, is that something, you know, you transitioned from obviously from playing through into coaching uh, and, you know, uh, there was a time when you were actually a player coach, weren't you? And I'm curious as to know whether, you know, that bringing that why in was something that you read about and recognised the value of it or was it something that you uh, experienced as actually being able to help you that actually came from internal or, uh, you know, was it one yeah, or the no, other or I a think... bit of both? Again, because I was playing, I was fortunate enough to play through, you know, the 90s, the 2000s and into the, you know, the late 2010s. And, and, and um, so therefore I saw that shift yeah. and I was in the dressing room when, you know, nobody would ever moan a, a little bit of harsh language and aggression early on. And then halfway through, there was a few question marks. And then it, probably the, the, the most eye-opening one was when I was at Kidderminster and one of the players came to me after a game and he went, God, oh, you're really angry on the pitch, aren't you? <laughs> and I thought that is the absolute opposite of me. Like I, anger is never anything that's aimed at me. I, you know, one of my strengths and weaknesses is that I'm particularly patient and calm. 
And so there's times where I look back and think I wish I'd have been a little bit more in your face there. But there's other times where my my kind of composure under pressure is a, of a real strength. And I, and, and I see it that way personally. But when he said that, it really made me think because I was just demanding high standards. But to him, I was being overly aggressive. So there was a massive shift there in how people were. And you could see if you said it to the wrong person, he I, I valued that he came to me and had a, had a chat about that. Some people just wouldn't talk to you for three weeks if you told them to F off on a pitch. Even if it was heat at the moment, you needed them to get in a certain position, you couldn't walk over and put your arm around them and say, oh, look, I just thought you might be able to do this a bit better and go here. You just quickly needed a reaction. And so it, it became apparent to me that things had changed. Things had really shifted. And then you, you heard the conversations because I was part of the dressing room as a player. Well, why are we doing that? You know, why does the manager want us to do that? I never really heard that early on. Yeah, you know, it, it was, it, it was, you know, just make sure you get that done because that'll help us win games. And then all of a sudden, well, why are we doing that? Why are we doing this in training? What's the what's the point? What? And so you start to realise that actually, if you're going to get real, real buy-in from those guys, and then you, you know, again, towards the end of my career, I suppose fortunately, middle of my career, 28, was when I absolutely knew I wanted to go into coaching and management. Okay. And so at 28, I realized I wasn't going to hit the levels as a player that I hoped I would. Uh, you know, I not through lack of trying, but physically I wasn't capable of playing any higher than I really did play. Um, I only ever wanted to finish playing and know that I had no regrets. I just wanted to be able to wake up at, at 35 when I thought I'd be done. But when you say that I, I, I knew I wasn't going to reach the levels that I had hoped for, what, what had you hoped for? And, you know, how did you come to that vision? So of I... I so I suppose it was my journey. So at 14, 15, 16, best in the country, captain of England, playing regularly, loads of teams wanted me to go and sign for them. Stayed at Sheffield Wednesday, signed there. 20, released by Sheffield Wednesday. So from best in the country at, at 16 and 17 to released at 20, m massive hit. But when I left, it wasn't, oh, woe is me. It was right, I'm going to show you. I thought it was them. I, I thought it was... I mean, in, in, in to a degree, I, it, there was a letdown. Fortunately for me, I was at Sheffield Wednesday at the worst possible time in their history where they were going from Premier League through a massive transition where they'd overspent, they'd not planned well, they'd signed the wrong players, they'd got through a load of different managers. I think I had like eight managers while I was there in a three-year period. And they were on the way down. They got relegated, they, all that kind of stuff. So in some ways, yes, I was a victim of a... a circumstance it, it wasn't really going my way they weren't going to play young players while they were in all kinds of turmoil so I wasn't getting an opportunity and I didn't make it. Nico sorry just to jump in why you know I'm, I'm really conscious of so many young players and you work with them now that really want to go on that journey some of them might be coming you know might be on the downward journey as it were you know as you say similar to yourself and recognizing that maybe their dream is not quite as they'd hoped. How, how did you manage that for you and, and what advice might you give to somebody on that pathway? Sorry to jump across you, but I just think no, it's such, it's no. Such a key... I mean, the advice, yeah, the, the advice that I would give and do give to everybody yeah. is, yeah. if you want it bad enough, the, I, I, every player that I've ever played with, coached, managed, they want to be a footballer. They want it bad. They work hard. There's very few players I've played with that don't work hard. You know, run around in training, try and get better, all that kind of stuff. There is even less that need to be a footballer. They don't want it, they need it, which means they go to bed at the right time every night because they know their body needs that to recover. They eat the right food like consistently because they know that's what their body needs to fuel it. They go to the gym, they search out better and maybe different ways of doing things through S&C, through diet and nutrition, because now they have that opportunity. We didn't have a nutritionist. We didn't have S&C particularly uh, back then. We didn't have, um, you know, a phone that we could Google and read a dozen articles on different things and make our own mind up on these things. It was just what was in front of you, you dealt with. Um, and so if you need it, if it is your absolute passion, then look into all those different things that you can do, find your way and day by day, knowing what you can control in front of you, go and do that. So I, I use the term next practice. So as footballers, we will always look way ahead. You know, the, the, a good example, the fixture list comes out at the start of the season and we'll go, oh, look, we've got Christmas. And then you'll, you'll look at the end of the season, you'll think, you'll look at your last five games, you'll think, oh, 
if we're up there and we, we've, we, we've got those five games left, we'll beat them, them and them. So I think we'll make it. Well, you're already way ahead of where you need to be because actually right now, all you can do is get better today. And so when I, uh, when I talk to young players and it's the hardest thing to get through to them because you don't know what you don't know, yeah. is that your time will go really quickly. You are capable and in control of so much is what, in what's ahead of you but often they'll be concentrating on the things they can't control. Am I going to play at the weekend? Why didn't I play at the weekend? Um, you know, how many, what we've got, who've we got in the youth cup 10 days from now? Things that have got no say. What am I going to, you know, what's my Instagram looking like right now? How am I getting enough likes on Twitter? All, all these kind of things that are noise. And for me, my, my way of looking at it was always that no matter what, when I finish playing, I can sit there and look back and go, I did everything I could to become the best that I could be. I just wasn't good enough to be what I really wanted to be. Um, you get, you know, in every walk of life, every people, every person I speak to, from my driving instructor when I was 17, Lovely. through to people that maybe stop and talk to me in the supermarket nowadays who are talkie fans and, and want a quick chat. Everybody's got a story about how they nearly made it. And that nearly made it for some people is so far from nearly, it's crazy. But in their mind, they nearly made it and that was their thing. <laughs> Don't be that guy that had a genuine chance of making it. So, you know, I'm lucky enough that I've always been working with professionals or somebody within a professional club. Don't be that guy that sits, wakes up one day at 35 and goes, do you know what? If I'd have worked harder, ate better, not gone out and drank every other night, if I'd have concentrated on what the coaches were telling me and really worked on my areas of strength and areas of deficiency, if I'd have spent less time worrying about why I didn't play the full game and just concentrated on making the most of the minutes I played, if I'd have lifted that extra weight and I'd have really put myself out of my comfort zone, I could have done more. I could have been better. Now, I know absolutely hands down that I did everything in my power to be the best I could be. At one point, I was eating pot noodles for pre-match because back in the early 2000s, everybody talked about carb loading. So I'd looked into it. Carbohydrates is what I need. I didn't know that pot noodle is full of all kinds of crap that's not good for you. I looked on the back and it said carbohydrates. Wow, that's quite a lot. I'll eat that for pre-match. So it wasn't that I didn't make mistakes, but I did the best that I could do with the knowledge that I had at any given time throughout my career. Yeah. So I can look back now and say, the reasons I didn't make it are I wasn't good enough. I, um, physically, I wasn't quick enough. I wasn't aggressive enough. I wasn't really strong or, enough. Or, or I guess, I, I, and I'm, I often do this, is, you know, you, you reached your potential or you reached your level, I guess. Yeah. 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 You, and so I've got that. You, you, you reached them, you, you maxed out kind of stuff. You got to where you got to. Or could and be. I'm comfortable with that. And, yeah. I, and I can look myself in the mirror and know that I've got no regrets because yeah. of it. So I, I leveled off at League Two. I played most of my games. I was lucky enough at Knotts to play 100 odd games in League One. I played one game for Sheffield Wednesday in the Championship and I was on the bench in the Premier League. That was the closest I got to setting foot out there. But most of my games, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to play nearly 700 and they were split between League Two and the National League. Um, and League Two was probably my level. I, I was at my best. I played my best football and, and, and peaked, I suppose. So, Nick, there'll be loads of people in the kind of the sporting system, not just football, as I say, who are really striving to try and reach the pinnacle and, you know, will find their level, won't they? And, I, and you touched on a point around sort of mental health earlier on. And I'm just thinking, you know, I'm sure there were many highs and many lows throughout that time. How did you manage yourself during some of those low times? You know, did you have any strategies or any mantras or, you know, what support system did you have around you to, to keep yourself up there so you didn't sort of drop into a, a really dark place? Because the goal at the end of it is so um, enticing, isn't it? And that's where people are so driven towards and it must be really difficult. So how did you manage that? I think some of it was, was intrinsic. Some of it was very much just this drive. I'd been told I wasn't good enough at Sheffield Wednesday and for 10 years, my mission was to show them that they were wrong. And, you know, my parents would have were very much of that ilk. Well, if, if you think we were wrong, go and show them that we were wrong. Right. Okay. And so, um, you know, I was fortunate when I left Sheffield Wednesday, I bounced back really quick. I got, um, 
my debut, full debut for Northampton. I signed non-contract terms with Northampton and my full debut was against Notts County. And because they could get me for free because I hadn't signed a proper contract, I ended up at Notts County and I had three years there. But after that, I spent the next three years earning less money than I was spending. I was at Scarborough for two years and Forest Green and I, I couldn't afford to live like that for a length of time, but I was finding a way to get through it along with my, my missus so as that I could continue to fight for this. I am good enough to get there. Now, I had good people around me. I had the mindset that I wasn't going to give up and I was going to get there. I did read, I, you know, I looked into stuff as best I could. So at the time, Paul McKenna was big. So I read some of Paul McKenna's book. <laughs> yeah. You know, it changed your life in seven days and things like that. <laughs> and there was some, there's some little nuggets in there that you take away and you think I can relate to that and that, that works. And some of it's, fluffy and nice and you know I didn't never got hypnotized or anything um but I, I took away the best I could all of those bits I had some good coaches yeah. that would continue to tell you that you know if you work on this and this you've still got a chance of getting you know higher up there so I had a good support system I had a good family I had a good support system and I was open-minded to learn what I could learn and then at 28 we got promoted or 29 got promoted into league two from Torquay and I, I wasn't playing overly well. At the time, I thought I was doing all right. But when I look back in retrospect, I wasn't doing great. And then uh, we played Bournemouth and they had a winger called Feeney, who's still playing now. I think he, was at, uh, he went from Bournemouth to Bolton to Millwall or somewhere like that. And he was quick and he was direct. And he got the ball and the Bournemouth manager at the time shouted, get their full back. He can't effing move. And at that point, and literally at that point, I thought, I'm not good enough to get where I want to get. I'm not physically capable of playing in the championship. I'm not, I'm just not. I'm getting my arse handed to me by a League Two winger right now. And as it happened, I played against Albert Adoma the week before, who was at Barnet at the time, and he'd ripped me to pieces. And I played against a guy at Bradford called Kyle Reed, who'd absolutely ripped me to pieces. I spent three weeks in a row getting ripped up. And this was that tipping point where I heard that comment and I thought, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to get back to the championship. And, and I kind of went away and I didn't know what reflection was at that point. Yeah. You know, it, I did it. I didn't know what it was. I can, I can say that now and make and try and sound intelligent and all the rest of it. <laughs> Brilliant. It was just, a, it, it was just a, a, a thing where I went home and I sat down and I thought, I'm good enough to play in League Two. I'm not far off this level. You know, at the time I was struggling to adapt from conference football to League Two football. And there was this much, it was this much, that the wingers that I was up against were, were a little bit quicker and had better quality. So in the conference, generally, they were either really quick, but didn't have any quality, or real good quality, but weren't physically very good. So I could adapt my game to play against either of those. But now I was coming up against players that could do both. And I, and I couldn't, at first, I, I couldn't adapt. But I knew that it wasn't far off. So I sat and I thought, I'm not going to play in the championship. I'm not going to get back there. No manager in his right mind is going to sign me from Torquay to play in the championship. But I could be a good League Two player. And I'm 28, 29. So I could also play for another six, seven, eight years if I look after myself. And at that point, I made the choice that I know I want to go into coaching. I know I want to go into management. I want to do all of the good stuff that managers did to me. And I want to get rid of all the crap that you have to deal with. I want to take all of the good... What, why, what was it that made you realise that you wanted to go into coaching or management? That Because of that. Because I'd spent so long in dressing rooms, hearing players and being part of it, talking about, this guy's brilliant. Right. This guy really knows his stuff. Wow, what about that session we did the other day? What about how detailed that was? What about his team talks? What about how he treats us? On the flip side, and way, way more, what an idiot this guy is. Why on earth did we do that? Why are we not doing more of this? Surely it's obvious to him that we need it. Why is he treating everybody so badly? Why is that guy training on his own? All these things that you see. So I looked at it and thought, I think I could do that. I think I could look after players in the way that I'd want them looked after, treat them how I'd want them treated and how I'd want to be treated. I think I could um, inspire a group of players to play together in a way that I think would be effective to win games and achieve something. And so I also thought I'm not ready to pack up playing. I love playing and I'm only going to get one go at doing it. So all of the pros that I played with coming towards the end of the career, they'd always say, play as long as you can play. No one ever said, pack it up the moment you realise you're not good enough. 
they would always say, just keep playing as long as you can play. And so I thought, I didn't ever want to drop down to really lower league, but I'm capable of playing for another six, seven, eight years at this level. I'm going to make sure that I do. But in the meantime, that was when I really started digging into psychology, okay. digging, okay. you know, digging into S and C, finding people, searching people out that could educate me on those things. So, you know, how do I get, you know, I wasn't physically better, but could I have been physically stronger if I'd have known more? Could I have been quicker if I'd have known what to work on when I was 22? So there's a real curiosity within you. I'm, you know, I'm hearing a bit of a parallel in, in a in a sense of when you were a player, you know, you you try to find a way to maximise the attributes that you had, you know, where where yeah. if they weren't the best possible, you would you would find a way, weren't you, to try and position yourself to maximise and get the most from you. And now I'm hearing this transition into coaching in the sense of actually I, I now realise there's a lot to know, but I don't know a lot about it yet. Uh, and how do I go out there and start being curious and exploring? So there's a similar, similar kind of principle and parallel. And, and, and I also want to just touch on and play back to you that idea around mindsets, because again, you know, I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, the principles that you take from both playing into coaching and into management and into scouting and to, into your later life, really. And there's something strong here about having kind of a, a mindset that's, uh, I hear some people even call it nearly a beginner's mindset. The mindset, yeah. actually, I'm going into here and I'm thinking, I, I need to learn about it and be curious and open to that world. And it, it, does that re resonate with you? Yeah, definitely. Because I, I, I want, as a, as a coach and a manager, it doesn't matter if I'm six foot four, five foot two, quick, slow, big, strong, none of that. You know, you want to look the part. You want to look after yourself. You want to live in the way that you're asking the players to live. You want to role model. You want to show them that, I still look after myself. I still eat well. I still live right. I still pride myself on being able to physically do the stuff that I could do. However, there's going to come a point where I can't, but that's still not going to stop what I can do up here. So I can be a coach or a manager for the next 30 years without a problem. But if all I do is go back to what coaches have done to me and recycle it, I'm not necessarily going to get any better. I might, I might be good enough. You know, I might have had a really good manager. I might try and copy what he does and it might work for a short time, but the game is changing so quickly that I need to really look into all of the stuff that can help a footballer because I want to be able to help young players. I want to be able to help young coaches. So I, I want to be the first port of call when somebody wants advice on something because they respect, understand and know that I will give them genuine, good, honest advice that they can go away and work with. And I get pleasure from helping those people develop, whether it's a player or a coach or a manager or just a friend. Um, and I think because there's so much out there now, you've got to sift through it. You've got, you've got to put out there. You've got to open your mind. You've got to go out there and have a look at what there is. And then you've got to make your own mind up. And then you've got to become the best version of you as a coach, the same as I wanted to become the best version of me as a player. The, the game is changing rapidly. So there's going to be what what is good practice now, you know, is five years from now might not be good practice. And 10 years from now, we'll probably look back and think, why on earth did we do that? It was dangerous. Because I think about when I first started, we the only kind of physical stuff you did was press the, sorry, sit-ups where you did that and you yeah. kind of went like this. And everyone now knows that that's probably not great for your spine. Um, yeah. But at the time, you know, come on, work harder, get those, you know, get yourself up, all the rest of it. Um, and so it's, if you go into that, the the journey will be more more important and more rewarding than whatever the destination is that yeah. you've, you've and that and that for me was me as a player. I wanted desperately to play in the championship. I wanted to live up to my early potential that I thought I had as uh, as England captain at 16. I wanted to buy my dad a Ferrari. I wanted to, you know, be a, a multi millionaire Premier League player dominating every week adored by the fans, all the kind of stuff that comes with being the best. And I, and I never got there. But you know what? Along the way, the stuff I learned about myself, about playing, about coaching, about, you know, living, all that stuff is well worth it to where I'm at now. And I don't see where I'm at now as the final bit. Yeah. Because I'm now, you know, like the head of coaching and all the stuff that you're learning in this, I'm back to being like, the young person in the room and trying to figure out what the best head of coaching looks like and yeah. how I can best help people from this position. 
Um, I've, I've done, luckily enough, I've done pretty much everything in football. I've played, I've coached, I've managed, I've scouted, I've done academy football now, I've done grassroots kids football, and, and now I'm in coach development. And so by the time I'm done with all this, I should be in a position where I can offer some real value to people out there at whatever that next level might be or whatever that next job might be, because it might not be football. It, it could be quite literally anything, but uh, I just want to make sure that I am role modeling, open-mindedness, learning, taking something away and actually doing something with it, you know, so it affects your practice. It's not just reading a load of stuff so you can sound intelligent, but still yeah. do the same things that you were doing anyway. But also the thing I've learned most in this last probably 12 months is also just to continue actually doing, don't get too caught up like I probably have done in desperately trying to find new things and figure things out and just do it. And if you make your mistakes, make your mistakes and then learn, learn from, from them. them. <laughs> go again. Yeah. You know, I, I probably in the first six months of being head of coaching, I was probably too far stepping back, looking at like, well, I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't really know what this job's supposed to be. I, I'm not quite sure how I can best help these people. So I'll just look and see and find out and ask questions and speak to people like yourself and the guys on the EHOC, and, uh, which is the course that we do on, on as a head of coaching. And, and try and find things out. And I forgot to actually just get on with it. So uh, w what I'm hearing is that you, you're not just doing though, it's about applying and, and putting into practice all of the good learning that you've, you've, you've gathered and you're picking up along the way, isn't it? It's not about, so it's, it's applying your, your learning, it's applying your interest, it's applying the stuff you know and, and trying it out whether it's gonna, so, so we're not holding back and waiting in case we get it wrong or yeah. waiting till we can get it right. It's about giving it a go and learning through, through action, which, kind of also really resonates for me a bit about maybe the kind of player you were in terms of you know we got on and we had a go and we got better through doing yeah and I, and I think that I, I, I am and was so desperate to be the best head of coaching there is out there <laughs> without actually knowing what head of coaching was because it's a fairly new position <laughs> and we're all fight, you know figuring it out and learning and and I forgot that actually you know even this even what we're doing now you yeah. know 10 people might watch it, 100 people, 1,000 people, whatever. And of those people, one person might take one thing from it and think, oh, actually, that, that could be good. And they might go away and do something, and then they'll probably pay it forward to somebody else, in which case it's worth it. I can, I think, give value and give um, learning and, and give advice and be of benefit to people just through my experiences and the relationships I build with them and the conversations that you have sometimes over coffee or sometimes formally or whatever it might be. I think it will probably help people without me necessarily knowing that it's helping them. But when I first came in, I was so desperate to find out what I should be doing and how it should be done that I forgot to just be me and I forgot to just get on with it. And, and, and what I've then learned is that stop worrying too much about all of that you know try and help people try and be good at what you do try and learn different ways and try and learn different techniques and all the kind of stuff that you do but don't be uh, in in my appraisal um the technical director used the term be more present while you're present and Lovely. that that probably sticks with me as much as anything is be brave get out there put your points forward have your opinions be, be open enough to change your opinion if somebody puts something forward to you that actually makes a lot more sense than what you were saying. Um, to... and, and Nika, do you think you've changed then as, a, as a, a person since you were a player? Do you think that's the same philosophy you had then or, or are you able to be a different Nico now that you're in a more experienced place within your career? No, I think, I think I'm the same person. Obviously, I think I've developed and I think I've learned more. But I think I'm the same person with a lot more of a conscious understanding of some of the stuff that I did. Yeah. There's not a lot that I did that I look back on and think, oh, wish I hadn't done that. You know, I haven't, I haven't genuinely haven't got many regrets because I've always lived by just trying to do right by people, you know, right by myself, knowing that I'm the first. And again, this probably goes right back to the beginning of the conversation, mum and dad upbringing. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't go to bed at night, I suppose, Best way of putting it is football for me, it's full of people that will stamp all over you to get their own way. It's full of people that will viciously and without remorse jump all over you to get a step ahead of you. 
it's also got people, it's got good people in it. Mm. Don't get me wrong. I don't want this to come across as too cynical and, and bitter and twisted because that's one thing I'll, I'll never be and always said that I'll never, I'll never allow football to turn me bitter, twisted and cynical. But it is, as an industry, full of a lot of people that are potentially don't have the same morals and ethics as what I will have. So therefore, I made it uh, abundantly clear in my mind that whatever I do, I will do the right way. And if I make a mistake, I'll apologize for that mistake and I'll learn from that mistake. If I upset somebody doing it the wrong way, if I, you know, again, some of the stuff we talk about in the academy is about um, the intention meant often differs from the intention felt. And I get that a lot. You know, I, you know, you do something thinking you've done the right thing and then you sit back and then you might hear something and think, oh, wow, I totally misread that situation. But not because I was trying to be nasty, not because I was trying to upset anybody because I thought I was doing the right thing. It just didn't come across that way to that person. So I know then I can go to bed every night and go and see my kids. I can go and see my wife knowing that I've lived by my moral code. Um, and I think that's massively important to me. This might be a really hard question, but again, some of our listeners here might be thinking, you know, that sounds great. And I would like to live by that code. H how do I do that? <laughs> I think um, you, you've just, first of all, you've got to know what it is. You, okay, you've got to okay. know, you know, what, what, what would you die by? What is your... What are you what do you are you not willing to do? I'm not willing to go behind anybody's back to do something to better me, to, to get a step ahead. I'm willing to have awkward conversations with people. I'm willing to sit people down and look them in the eye and tell them things that they might not want to hear. And I want to do better for myself and I want to do better for my family, but I'm not willing to set somebody else back by being underhand or being you know wrong or being vicious or being nasty in the wrong way if that's what you want to be there's going to be times where people will do the opposite to you so without throughout my football career I've had um, experiences where I've been dumped on where I've been people have been underhand people have been nasty people have done things in a way that I wouldn't do and unfortunately it's hurt me but I'm still not willing to do that. I won't allow those things to turn me thinking that that's going to get me ahead. And some of these guys have got, you know, decent jobs and, and are, uh, maybe financially better off than what I am right but, now. Yeah, you've learned through those experiences. They've really informed you, haven't they? Rather than you've become them, they've informed who you are and what's important to you. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I think there's this perception that as much as things are changing, a lot of football... The, the people that make the decisions are still the people that were there right at the beginning of my career. In fact, they were that generation. So a lot of football still has this, we're going to rule through fear, just doesn't work anymore. It might work for a short period of time. You might get an immediate uh, reaction from a group of players or coaches if you go in there and start being, you know, a tyrant and, and all that kind of stuff. But it won't work for any length of time. It's just, we've, we've kind of gone past that, I think, as a, as a generation, and, and and like I said before, some some of it we should keep. Some of it is right to have um, is right to have moved on. Mm. But I think that's the best way of putting it. Um, people think that honesty can sometimes be a weakness. They think that I've had it thrown at me a few times. Were well, you too nice to be a manager? Well, it's not nice sitting somebody down and honestly telling them face to face that they're not playing that week or they're they're gonna you know they're not gonna coach this team this week because I don't think you're doing this well enough right now however this is what I'm going to do to help you get better at that to get back in my team for argument's sake a lot of fans like it seems the idea of a manager absolutely drilling some young player and getting in the face and being aggressive and rah, rah, rah. and you don't have to be that way. You, you don't have to be that way to be successful. At times, you've got to be firm. At times, you've got to be straight and to the point. And at times, you've really got to make people uncomfortable. That's part and parcel of leadership and management and, and people getting better is getting them out of their comfort zones. But you don't have to sacrifice your morals to do that. You don't have to be underhand to do that. You can do that face to face. You can look people in the eye while you're doing it. And you can give them bad news. You can release them. You can 
you know, I've released players where I've sat there and had to go, look, you, I'm not giving you a contract. I'm not giving you a contract because of this, this, and this. I'd love to help you in the future if you understand why it's happened. But because I've treated them well and I've treated them properly and I've been honest throughout that period, most of them have got up, shook my hand and moved on. Mm. And, and some of them now, you know, I, I still talk to and they still come back to me for advice and we're still friendly with because they now look back and understand why and they've, they've got a better understanding of that. But I'm, I'm not a believer and never will be that you can't be a good, nice person and not be successful in the game. Um, and that is my ongoing thing that I, I want to prove. It's part of your moral compass, that, isn't it, in terms of where you keep coming back to. It seems like it informs who you are and how you are. Yeah, I, I just think that on it, on, it's, it's easy to be honest if that's... Oh, it's easy to be honest if that's what you're about. It's not easy to be honest if you're giving someone bad news, but I'd rather make it uncomfortable for myself to give them that news than I would not tell them until the last minute when it's a massive shock to them and they've yeah. got no idea why this has just happened, which happens a lot in football. Um, I just think that there's better ways of doing things and I'm, I'm determined to live by that, whether it's as a head of coaching or a manager or a coach or you know, wherever my career takes me next, because I think that you can be successful doing that and understanding the modern player and the modern person and how people, you know, there's an, an element of emotional intelligence there. Yeah. Um, I'm not well versed enough yet to be fully conscious of what my emotional intelligence levels are. I think it's pretty good. It seems to work because my relationships are generally pretty good, but I'm not quite sure how. So that's something I'm, I'm looking into now. How can I help somebody who is really, really good in terms of detail and organization and all of the X's and O's? but struggles to strike up emotional relationships with their players and trust and rapport and all the things that will then want those, make those players want to work for you and want to get better and, and want to come to you for advice because that, that synergy and that, that relationship will allow great things to happen. You know, that, that I've had players that, you know, worked with them for two months and they've gone on to bigger and better things because the relationship was strong, the trust was strong, the, the rapport was there. But I'm not quite sure how I get it yet. It just seems to be a... Well, well Nico, I'm, I'm smiling here because in some ways, you know, um, for me, I, I do quite a lot of work around emotional intelligence. And I think it's a lovely phraseology that kind of captures a lot of the work we do in not just in sport, but in in business and in leadership kind of roles. Because as you quite, like, quite rightly say, it's about kind of connections and how we have good, solid, productive relationships. And, and for me, the starting point uh, for, for anything around emotional intelligence is, is a, a better self-awareness, you know, and just by going through the conversation we have today and you sharing your story shows a, a real great insight into, you know, the, the highs and the lows and the whys and the wherefores of your journey, which is, which is about emotional intelligence, it's about awareness of what's really triggered me and what, what works well, what doesn't work well and what areas I'm still looking to develop. So, you know, I, I think it's a, it, it's a lovely conversation which is grounded for me in the, in the basis of emotional intelligence and I, I only hope that you know even a, a sharing your story back here will help you in terms of deepening your awareness of yourself um, but also help our listeners in terms of them getting to think about actually what does this story mean to me or ask themselves the questions that you've asked yourself so you know I just wanted to thank you for for being open and honest around that and I want to just t touch on um Another part which you said earlier on, which is about the, the helper in you. You know, you're, you're here to try and help develop people. And I would like to ask you a number of quick fire questions just to kind of round us off here, which will hopefully give some real insight for our listeners to jump on and help them even further. So you, well, I'm playing to your moral compass here about you wanting to help people and be uh, intentional. How does that sound? interesting yeah. let's do it yeah okay Go so on. so you know uh, i think something that's really resonated with me throughout all of the podcasts is you know um you you've echoed it here as well is that you know you, you've gone away and learned um you came out of football and you said wow I, there's lots of stuff i didn't know here and i've gone and looked for it i've found out i've been curious and i've explored so i'm going to ask you you know what kind of reference places or books have you gone to which have really resonated with you and are there two or three kind of books or resources which you would recommend others to go to that really worked for you so i would say it's it almost snowballed so okay. the first thing i did was by chance or well, not the first thing but you know i i just looked into things like psychology books 
yeah. and then yeah. just took a, a, a random pick of a few just to see what it was. And you get an immediate feel when you're reading them as to, as to what they are and how they are. You get recommendations of friends all the time uh, and, and people in and around the industry, but probably just by chance, a hypnotherapist when I was at Torquay as a player was a, was a Torquay fan. And he approached me and said, look, you know, I don't know if you're into this kind of thing, but I'd be more than happy to have a couple of conversations with you. Now, that's easy to say, oh, thanks very much. I didn't know him at the time. So thanks, really appreciate that. But no, 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 I'm fine. And, I, and at that point was where I'd had the, you know, well, what can I do to get better? And I thought, you know what? Yes. Yeah, that'd be great. Let's do it. So I went to see this guy. And the first time I saw him, I was expecting, you know, look into my eyes, look into my eyes. And, and I'd wake up and that'd be that. And it was a totally different, totally, totally different thing to that. It was um, a lot more you know, conscious and self-aware and all that kind of stuff. And we started talking and first one, I came away and as I was doing it, I was thinking, all I'm thinking about here is what I'm having for tea later and what I've got on tomorrow and all the rest of it. So I was going to leave it and he rang me and he said, what do you think? And, and again, honesty, I've got to be honest, I didn't get it. I was thinking about everything except what you were saying. I didn't really feel that comfortable. Uh, what, you know, what, what we're on about. So he said, well, come on in again and we'll have another go because it comes, you know, there's, there's practice to this. Mm -hmm. So we went in and I struck this relationship up with this guy. He then started recommending a few books. So things like um, The Chimp Paradox was one of the first that, that was mentioned. And I know it's got its flaws, but it was interesting because again, it's not so much the content, content of the book, it's the questions it gets you asking once you've read it. Brilliant. So I know, like all of us, we've got that voice in our mind. I know that I'm actually fairly in control of mine for the most part. I also know loads of people that completely go off at a handle at, at, at things that, why? So that got me asking those questions. So then I go back and we start talking about other things. Um, I got to see, I went to see a chiropractor. So I went to see a chiropractor because I was having a few issues. Somebody recommended this chiropractor. Some people think it's pie in the sky. I thought, why not? So I went to see the chiropractor. The chiropractor was absolutely brilliant. I felt great about it. Experience, from my, my experience was great. He knew somebody who was big in S&C. Why don't you go and see this guy? Because we started talking. I talked to him openly about how I want to improve and I want to get better. He went, oh, it's funny you should say this. I know this guy who's absolutely brilliant at strength and conditioning. And he might be able to help you out on your diet as well. What do you think? Yes, I'll do that. So I went and saw this guy. This guy turned out to be one of the biggest mentors in my professional career. He got me... Uh, helped me get fitter, stronger, better in all of those areas than I'd ever been before. Educated me a little bit on diet and nutrition. Again, there's so many different ideas on that, that his ideas were one thing, but that led to questions and ideas elsewhere. So now you're branching off in different ways. So from one saying yes to something that might have been a bit out there, I then ended up on this journey meeting several different people in different areas that then recommended their own books and their own um, experiences and their own other people that you could go and talk to and meet. So all of a sudden now I've got a network of people that are experts in their own domain, some of which some people would laugh at, some of which some people would swear by. Um, it just seems to lead to the very next thing and the very next book and the very next bit of learning. And, and each one of them has their, so I got released as a, as a player at um, Torquay. And the, the hypnotherapist recommended a book called Who Stole My Cheese? Um, that was a good one for anybody going through some kind of transi transition where, for me, coming to the end of my career and starting to realise that this was going to be a big change, that was quite a nice one. Again, it reinforced a lot of my beliefs about just getting on with it and being in control of the very next thing and all the rest of it. But that was a nice little read. It only took about three days to get through. It's yeah. a tiny <laughs> it's a short one, yeah. But anybody who's going through a, a period of um, self-doubt or not quite knowing what they want to do next or potentially a change of career, because all of us footballers struggle massively, massively when it comes to the end of playing and then you're not playing. That's a, a, a massive shift. And it, it gave me a bit of insight onto that. But I think being open-minded and understanding how many experts there are out there now in any area that you can possibly think of, and one will it almost indefinitely lead to the next. And some of it you'll look at and think, nah, I'm not having that. I don't believe it. I don't want it. I'm not interested. My only advice would be, if like me, you end up going down these rabbit holes, don't let yourself get tied in knots and not actually use some of it to influence what you're doing. So don't read it, think that's great, and then forget about it. If you think it's great, 
try it in practice and see if it works for you and your your coaches or your players or whoever it is that you're working with um and be brave to try that and if it doesn't work fine go back and maybe try something else or try it with a selection of people try it on yourself you know like again the s c guy brilliant i know now that that worked for me therefore it will definitely work for some other people but not everybody and so again it's just this and all of a sudden it goes like this and 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 that's probably where i'm at now is you know talking to people like yourself you know off what we're doing this talking to mentors on the ehop course talking to other heads of coaches talking to other coaches it's just a huge amount out there for you to glean pretend that it's yours turn it into um what you want to do to you know it does it fit with who you are and how you want to do things have a go at it and and just keep on going because it what what became most apparent to me and i know it's a i don't know who said it but the more i learn the less i realize that i know I love I love that little quote as well because I think as we go through life I think we be, we really do begin to realize that there is so much out there and three small phrases which I picked up from what you've just said there is your approach to saying why not and just having a go um, continually asking questions of anything that comes your way but in a not not in a questioning way but in a curious kind of way um, and being open minded to to what comes. And with that said, then, Nico, if I move us on to thinking a little bit around, actually, what would be the two or three bits of key advice you would give to somebody who was going to come through a career in sports similar to yourself? You know, looking back over the career you've had, what advice would you give? Because loads of people listening into the podcast are really interested in careers in sport, whether they be football, but also kind of that performance kind of journey. You know, what would be the two or three key nuggets of kind of advice or guidance you might give to them based on your experience i think the first two that jumped to mind straight away yeah uh, great one i i touched on earlier which was what i know as next practice i'm sure other people know it something different but only ever worry about the very next thing that you can affect so if you are a sports person and it's about your physical capability of performance then What's the next meal you're going to eat that's going to make you better? What time are you going to bed tonight to make sure that you're ready? If, if you're, you know, we, I got to the point where you break this down into real detail. So if I go in the gym and I'm told I need to lift that weight, like three sets of 10, don't worry about the third set. Just lift it once and then think about lifting it again. And then the next time and all these bits add up. So you, you, you incrementally get better towards the, the goal of what you Brilliant. want to be. You're also then, you know, that old saying, I'll make sure I get it right, but the, the anxious man lives in the future, the depressed man lives in the past and the content man lives in the present. That I live by because it's absolutely true, particularly in sport, um, because you can think back to your glory days as a player like I sometimes do and you, if you're not careful, you can go down that route a little bit too much. You can think too far ahead. Well, what now? Where am I going? I'm not a player anymore. What am I going to do? If you're where you need to be and you stay in the process and you stay in the present, you'll always be okay. You'll, you'll certainly mentally be where you want to be. Um, and the, the classic one, really, don't get too high, don't get too low. Try and find that. I mean, that that's not groundbreaking. I've got no idea who first said it. But in sport, more than any other industry that I've ever come across, the highs are exceptionally high if you allow it. The lows are exceptionally low if you allow it. And it ties in with that next practice. Enjoy the high, enjoy the win, enjoy you know whatever it is that's gone well, but don't dwell on it because the, the good stuff can, can take you away from where you're trying to go as well as the bad stuff can. And too often in sport, you know, you see it all the time. You see it in the Premier League, you see the best in the world doing it where they win a game they lose the plot. They think they've absolutely nailed it. And then they'll lose the next three because they're still thinking about the one that they won. Or they'll lose a game and the world caves in and, oh, my God, the fan base has completely lost the plot. And they need to sack the manager. The players aren't good enough. Blah, blah, blah. And it, and it just completely nosedives everything. So don't get too high. Don't get too low. Next practice. Just just concentrate on the very next thing you can affect and, and work towards wherever you want to get. Love it. Uh, and I, just to play on to the idea of being content 
in in the present you know and you've, you've also mentioned that about kind of trying to really be here and now and in the present in the work that you're doing what advice would you give to a teenage version of yourself now looking back and I know that goes against li- living in the past but you know um, would there be any advice you know what have you really learned and in, in a in a sentence what would you now say to yourself knowing what I know now yeah. Um, yeah. And, and having been through it yeah I, it would be exactly the same two yeah. things um, it, it you know enjoy it enjoy yeah, it really <laughs> enjoy it you know I it, it gets too serious at times uh, you know partic- again particularly in sport I know people enjoy their jobs. We, we often in football use the phrase like, well, it's better than being stuck in an office. I'm sure people enjoy their jobs in an office. So I don't want to d- degrade anybody's work or anything. You know, the two, fr- you, you often hear like, well, you could be on a building site. Well, I'm sure people on building sites might love what they do. And so it's probably a bad analogy. But the fact is that 99% of the population would love to be out there playing football or coaching football every day. This is absolutely a great industry, a great game, and whatever game it is that you play, whether it be a sporting game or a, um, you know an academic game, or whether you are in offices or whatever it might be, um, enjoy it because it 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 goes really quick one way or another, and change is inevitable. It will come at some point, um, and, and embrace that change when it does. So I think. It's, it all goes along the same lines as what I talked yeah. about. Next practice, don't get too high and too low and just enjoy what you're doing. Fantastic. Really solid, um, simple messages, actually, but really hard to keep um, present at and actually keep making sure that we're, we're, we're working towards enjoying ourselves. So I think, got, you know what, I think that's the, that would be the thing I'd end on, is that I would love to sit here and say something that is mind-blowing and that is, like, completely new and that, oh, my God, that's, you know... Jedi like but the fact is that those things that sound so simple aren't simple Mm. you have to practice them and work on them and become self-aware enough to actually recognize that you're going away from it so it I would say it's probably taken me 10 years to get to the point where I can bounce back from a a, a bad moment or a bad day or whatever it might be the same (laughs) as I don't get carried away on a good thing it's not as easy as what it sounds but I, I'd love to try and, you know, I'd love people to be calling you up saying, I need that guy's number because that was something I've never heard before. I'm sure everybody who hears this would have heard it, but how many will be able to say that that's exactly what they do and they're in control of it? Well, Nico, I like simplicity because I think, you know, often what we talk around in the work that I do and, you know, resonates probably in your world is actually in the, in the high performing environments that we're trying to create and develop, often going back to basics and doing the simple bits well is what gets us through, you know, and actually creates those high performing environments. So, you know, I, I really echo what you're, you're saying there. So for me, I've got two more quick questions. All right. One, the first one would be, um, you've, you've mentioned your journey, you've mentioned one or two people, but I, I'm really curious, are there any real standout people who you would say are key pivotal influences on your life? And, and if so, who are they? And very quickly, uh, why? You did mention, obviously, your parents and your father, your mum and your father, actually. But are there any others as well? Yeah, I mean, you know, parents go without saying, supportive, there for you. Um, you know, helped me through those early years where I wasn't as independent as what uh, you know I am now. Um, my wife, you know, she's been with me throughout my whole football journey. Right. So to be able to, it's almost in her case, it's like ignorance is bliss. She knows nothing about football. <laughs> doesn't want to know anything about football yeah. and it's quite grounding because when I go back and oh my god we've lost the game and the fans were booing me today and all the rest of it just go and put dinner on will you the kids have, uh, have had a tough day and we need to do that and so there's a certain level of grounding there that it's it's not life or death so get over yourself yeah um but also a, a, an ear there and somebody to talk to and she'll you know uh, a bit of compassion now and then she's not completely hot <laughs> um, and then I've had, I suppose, mentors along the way. So the S and C guy that I spoke about yeah, there. Yeah. If something's going well, yeah, always put me in my place. He'll always question why well, you think it's going well, but it could go better. That's not good enough. This isn't good enough. Make sure that's better next time. If something's going badly, he'll reassure that you're on the right path. Believe in the process. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't sort of high it. support, high challenge kind of idea by the sounds of it. Exactly. So again, don't get too high, don't get too low. Yeah. He, he, he'd never allow that. He was particularly good at it. Um, and then I suppose just people along the way, guys along the way that have just been 
um, good mentors and good people to to learn from, talk to, you know, confide in that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, Nico, you've you've shared your journey, bringing out a couple of these people who have been key influencers along your way. And, you know, I, I want to, first of all, thank you for, for being open and honest. And, you know, I, in the jobs that we do, and, you know, there are very many parallels in terms of helping and supporting individual people in sport. There are so many people I, I still speak to nowadays that would, as you say, really love to work in sport and really understand the journeys that we've been through. A question I'd like to put to you is, you know, based on that, are there any people whose sports story you would like to hear more of or are curious about? You know, somebody in the future that might like to come on the, the Sports Stories podcast? Cool. I think there's loads, yeah. I mean, I, I like hearing... I, of course, I enjoy hearing stories from other footballers and, and, yeah. and, and football managers and coaches, but I also like to hear the, the parallels in other sports. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, and anybody that has, you know, spent time in and around a certain sport, uh, um, and again, anything, sometimes it's a sport you'd never even think of that opens your mind to something that you, you just wouldn't have seen coming. Is there anybody uh, in particular that you can think of? Cool. Well, there's some, you know, some world-class athletes that jump out at me, but, um, you know, I, I'd love to... The elite. So I'd, I'd love to hear from like a, a Tiger Woods, of course. I'd love to hear from um, Tom Brady. You know, he's probably one right now who is 43, still playing at the highest level, just won his game last night um, uh, against the, the New Orleans Saints. So I, I like the NFL because I think there's a lot of lessons within that industry yeah. in terms of hard work and dedication that we could learn. Yeah. You know, I, I, there's a there's a program on uh, on Teddy called um, All or Nothing, where it follows some NFL teams through their their you know their season, and it's incredible how much work goes in from the players, from the coaches, from the, the people behind the scenes. I, I would love to witness that and have a look at that and see about you know any tricks of the trade, any advice that those guys would give because that's a brutal sport played by some elite athletes. Um, their lifespan in that sport is very short. Yeah. Um, and it's it's fascinating to me how they go about it. Um, uh, but I, I think, you know, any sports person that has been in and around it has succeeded greatly or has failed massively. I would love to hear from, from those kind of people and hear what, what got them there, what helped them stay there. Um, what, what their best coaches were, or if it is a coach, the best advice from those guys, what, what, they've, what they've experienced, what they've done, the best results that they've got, the worst results that they've got. I think as somebody in my line of work, they're the bits that really, really interest me. Um, and psychologists as well. I think you know anybody that you've got on there that you could get hold of that could give people a, an idea on the inner workings and how it you know, a conscious idea of what these bits are that we're talking about that, that's always fascinating to me as well well Nico, I, I can definitely see your kind of curiosity coming out there in terms of you know trying to grab a little bit of, of something from from everybody you know and there's some real great names there and I, I guess just to finish us off today though I, I would like to just thank you for offering your advice and giving us a real insight into your journey and your life you know and and the story that you've been through in in, in football particularly in the highs and lows of that because you know what we're really trying to do is is give an insight and give an example of of what goes on and a, a, a real experience actually you know and and I think what you did say earlier on which really resonates for me it's not about people coming in and copying your journey but actually looking for little snippets of of guidance or tips or or questions that might fall out of what's happened for you and how that might resonate for them is is the real intent and, you know, and I, and I really hope that can provide both comfort and inspiration um, and possibly even guidance and give some people some help to navigate and get to a place where they're enjoying their job. And whether it be in football, whether it be in a different sport or whether it be, as you say, on a building site or in an office or wherever, I think there's so many principles that we can take out of the journey that you've shared today. So thank you ever so much for that. And, you know, and I really like the place to where you've got to in terms of actually remaining curious, asking those questions, but also trying to really remain present and in the process and actually enjoying today or the next 
the next practice or the you know enjoying the process of whatever comes next because that's what we can really control and i think you've really laid that out uh, pretty plain and pretty clear so so thank you for that if people were interested to find out a little bit more about what you're doing and you know what we haven't touched on a great deal is your role as the the head of coaching at exeter city and you know i have had a colleague of yours on and i know that you're doing some really fantastic work yourself and Aaron down at, uh, at Exeter City and I know you're keen to shout about that and let people understand more about what you're doing at the club and how you're developing and supporting players then you know how might they be able to to make contact with you or, or follow the work that you do? Yeah I mean again I suppose part of that change of generation I, I'm on all forms of, of social media so I'm easy enough to find on uh, on LinkedIn, on, on Twitter, on uh, even on Instagram, my wife tried to get me on there, but I'm not naturally one that just takes random photos of my coffee or my dinner. But um, I try and I try and show what I'm about, give some experiences on there. Um, always happy to, to you know help out if I can. Any other aspiring players, coaches, or anybody of any any ilk. Um, but yeah, I mean the, the stuff that Exeter City do. That's that's a, that's another podcast. I mean they are the club itself, how it's run, the shared vision, the understanding from first team to academy to community is is really something very special and, and hopefully we can continue our, our little run of success that we're having at the moment but yeah. um no thank you thank you very much for having me um really really enjoyed it it's always really interesting and like I say it's it gets me as well it's beneficial to me to, to talk about these things because things jump back out at you and you you go and reflect a bit more well, keep on the reflective journey, and, and I, I've really enjoyed it. You know, keep up the good work down in Exeter. We will be, we will be sort of following from a distance. But you know, I think as you say, there's another podcast in there, and and you know, Nico, it'd be great to have you back on future down the line. You know, let's find out what you've been up to, and and keep up the good work. And what I'll make sure is I'll put your um, contact details and so on in the show notes that support the podcast. Should anybody wish to uh, make contact with you, but thanks again. Really enjoyed it. Take care. Thanks, Dave. So there we have a great insight into the story and the journey Nico took through football, plus a lot about what he thought and how he now feels. For me, that really touches on his philosophy, his values, his belief, and what's really important to him. Along the way, a lot of things have come up for me in terms of my reflections. And what I want to bring to you is just the three things that are really key for me. I'd also be really keen to hear what yours are. The one thing for me that really struck out was the highs and lows of him navigating his football career and his story and how he navigated them, the things that really mattered to him, but also what the industry was really like and how it really um, played out in his early days, you know, him leaving home so early, what that really meant to him, but also him having to grow up so very quickly. And I think that's a real great insight into the sacrifices he's had to make, but also the impact and the influence of that. And I think for people going through those stories nowadays, that's really key and, and really important. I also really like the idea of the saying that he shared, which was don't go too high and don't go too low. It was really interesting for me because I also understand that Barack Obama also has used that, that saying in his career through, uh, through politics. I, I'm not suggesting that Nico's journey and Barack Obama's is the same, but I think the principles of trying to keep really level-headed and on a balanced kind of view of the world really benefited both of them. The second thing that really stuck me in terms of Nico's story and I think is really relevant for most people is the idea of a positive mindset. The idea of a positive mindset for me um, is, is really great. I think it's a term that's quite often used nowadays and what I'd like to bring into it is the idea of a, a learning mindset or even a beginner's mindset because for me what Nico really started to show and which I would encourage us all to consider is you know if we go in with a, a beginner's mindset or a mindset where we have a lot to still learn and actually it's really healthy and good to learn then what we get is um, the idea of becoming much more curious we're asking questions and we're actually really able to sort of gain more value from the experience so that positive mindset has a real um, good edge to it for me about actually how do we navigate especially through some of the low parts of our career but also when we're in the high parts what we can really glean from that and the last thing in terms of Nico's story which really resonated for me and it, this is not just through Nico's story this has been from many is the idea of of being honest in your reflections and I think why that's really important for me is that we can therefore become a really good barometer and for me, what Nico started sharing is his honesty about actually where he was in the, the kind of the pyramid of football, how, how his abilities were really finding their own personal level. And for me, if we're not honest about where we're at, then we're not a very good gauge of where we are. And also we can't use that as very trustworthy 
um, content and information to guide ourselves. So uh, as I always do, I'm quite biased towards this, but I really encourage often the idea of increasing our self-awareness, really focusing on how we feel and what we think as being something really important to us. So now what I'd like to lead us on to is a couple of questions that I'd like to pose. I'm conscious I've already posed a couple of ideas or thoughts um, in terms of what resonated for me. But the questions that really flow out of today's uh, episode is these two. What are the key attributes you have in your life that you would deem to be your main strength, but how could they also be a, a weakness to you? And I'll, I'll ask that question just for you to consider how the shadow side or the darker side of things that you often see as a strength might also be a negative to you. Conversely, things that you see as a negative also might be a positive to you. So really become aware of how you use your key strengths. Okay, the second question, bearing in mind we talked about a positive mindset, I'd like to ask you two things to consider. Okay, on a daily basis, why not consider what have you learned today? And also the second thing is, what are you most appreciative of? And by asking yourself those two questions on a daily basis will really help us clean and move towards being positive more of the time. So with those two questions in mind, okay, I'd like to also put to you the idea of these reflections are great, the questions are great, and we must listen to them. But when we conclude things from our reflections and then actually take action, then we can actually use those to really benefit our, our lives and benefit our behaviours. So what I would really like to encourage you to do is to take action. Okay. So with taking an action in mind, what I'd like to also encourage you to do, and that would be really helpful to me and to the audience, and also potentially some new listeners, is to comment, to leave a review, possibly even subscribe. So take action to, on your preferred podcast channel, to take action and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the future guests and also find out about the future content that we hope to provide. The other action I would like you to consider taking would be the idea of who is in your support network and how might you better use a coach or a mentor I'm really conscious that a lot of our previous guests have also either been coaches, people developers, but have also shared who has positively impacted on their life and who's been a great influence and a support to them. Again, I might be biased here, but I really strongly believe by having a coach or a mentor or somebody external to your world to be that really great sounding board or to be that guide or to ask you those questions that you might not ask yourself has been really, really important. A couple of um, guests who come to mind here not only in Nico's story today but also Steve McCormack um, was another one another one of our recent guests who really shared how a coach or somebody external to him really impacted and made him think differently and more positively so there's a real benefit in that so I'd like you to take those real great benefits out of that consider a coach or a mentor and um, if, if it's not for you right here, right now, please engage in the website. Have a look at the website. It's www.sportstories247.com. We've got the backlog of all of the guests on there. There's also some further resources through the, the Sports Stories Academy, which I've mentioned before, and things are beginning to grow a little bit more there. And there's further details, obviously, about the coaching and mentoring. Please keep in touch, keep engaged. Uh, I really thank you for being on the journey with me and supporting the Sports Stories content. Um, if you have any further questions or ideas on how we can further improve and, and add greater value to you, please drop us a line. But following that, uh, I'd just like to leave a, a last thank you to today's guest, Nico. Thanks a lot for sharing what you have shared. Uh, I hope you've made a difference. And I know that you even mentioned if we made a difference to one person's life, then that would be fantastic. And I'm sure and confident that we've, we've uh, had a difference or made a few more people than that just think. So thank you to you for listening. Uh, and I really look forward to having you with me, Dave Levine, on next week's show when we have another great guest. Till then, take care and look after yourself.